Hello viewers, welcome once again to our ongoing series Mendelism and Beyond. In the past few lectures, we have dealt at length about the Mendelian principles, their statistical applications and how the ratios of Mendelism can be applied to plants and animals alike. After that, we also made a strong point that not all of Mendel's ideas were to be assimilated in toto because of the discovery of so many exceptions uh, after Mendelism. And this we had mentioned in the special topic of the lectures that were entitled Beyond Mendelism. We are still within that realm of events and the interactions which were not mentioned by Mendel or perhaps uh, he did not like to mention. Linkage was one of them because uh, these particular results were perhaps uh, not the expected ones and they did not fall into the stereotype of 3 is to 1 or 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. But then uh, one should remember that uh, those fundamental discoveries were of course the milestone ones and they definitely laid down the foundations of modern day genetics. In today's lecture, we are going to focus on certain interactions which are not between the alleles of the same gene. So, they would be called as intergenic interactions and a whole interesting aspect uh, emerged after Mendel's paper was recognized and he was made the father of genetics and the most ardent supporter was uh, uh, Professor Bateson who also tried to duplicate all Mendel's ratios and crosses in animals and found them to be true. But Bateson and Punnett went beyond and they found out that there were certain exceptions too and they tried to analyze and then to rationalize and even gave justifications of what these extensions could be. So, just to uh, give you a little recap, uh, you can see on your screens the uh, summary of Mendelian inheritance and that is a monohybrid cross having a phenotypic ratio of 3 to 1 and likewise a dihybrid cross having a ratio of 9, 3, 3, 1. However, we also studied in details several exceptions to uh, these ratios because of the behavior, the abnormal behavior of the alleles within a genic pair and that led to the concept of incomplete dominance, co-dominance, the concept of multiple alleles, a very interesting one and the last lecture that we had was on polygenic inheritance or polygenes. We also talked in details about uh, pleiotropy and uh, uh, in future we talk about the penetrance and expressivity of a particular trait because not all capital A, capital A 100 percent are going to, to show that particular phenotype and definitely you cannot exclude the effect of environment. So, that means based on all these aspects, the phenotypic ratio is bound to vary. But one thing is very clear and the basic principle that we have to follow is that segregation and the idea of independent assortment is universal and they are operative during all the distribution of uh, the alleles within the gametes. So, then when we talk of gene interaction, that means we are now going beyond the alleles. We are perhaps talking about how a particular gene 
is going to interfere with another gene when we say another gene then obviously we mean that it is the other gene is residing on a different locus so how are these two genes that are located on different loci are going to interact one of them could inhibit the function of the other both of them could supplement each other both of them could collaborate with each other and all sorts of interactions would be there in order to give rise to a situation which is different from the expected ratio of 9 is to 3 is to 1. So, that means basically gene and interaction is going to be a phenomenon of two or more genes which are affecting the expression of each other in different ways. However, they are going to control a single character or the same character. So, as I have said before, the genes are going to show independent assortment all right. They are going to uh, be segregated into different gametes independently all right. But then to say that each gene always acts independently as far as its phenotypic expression is concerned that requires more elaboration. Instead, what we find is that the effects of genes on one locus will actually depend primarily on the presence of what the other genes are expressing, howsoever different loci they are placed in. So, that means the, these non allelic genes, how they are inter going to interact, even when they are present at different loci, is the topic of our discussion today. So, that means one point is clear that all these interactions that we are going to talk about are intergenic. So, let us find out the inter allelic interactions would be interactions between the genes of the same allelic pair which we have studied in Mendelian genetics. But then what is intergenic interaction? As you can see on your screens, the inter allelic interaction or intergenic interaction would mean the interaction between different genes. It could be two, it could be even uh, more than two. So, that means there must be some basic principles that are going to govern the intergenic interaction. So, some of the salient features that we can, uh, we can uh, list are that uh, the idea is that first point which is absolutely essential would be that these interacting or the concerned genes are present on different loci. Were they present on the same locus, then the idea would have been A, capital A interacting with small a and vice versa. So, that was Mendelian genetics. But then these particular uh, genes, they are unlinked. So, that means there is no linkage between them. So, as far as Mendelian principles are concerned, they are still following because they are going to assort independently. The other idea would be that in case of complete dominance, then the two genotypes capital A, capital A or capital A small a as you can see on the screens. Likewise, with capital B, uh, a capital B that is homozygous dominant and the heterozygous dominant would have the same effects. Now, here we would like to introduce a new concept in uh, genetics and its calculations. Because in Mendelism, we are always obsessed with a checkerboard, a Bateson and Punit square. Uh, if you have a little more experience, if you have to do more complicated calculations, then we now would think in terms of abbreviated ratios. So, in point number 4, what you can see on your screens is A dash and B dash. That means, this is going to be the representative of both the combinations because we say that in this combination, there is at least one capital A and at least one capital B. So, it could be both homozygous as well as heterozygous. So, it is assumed. Then all the crosses in case of intergenic interactions have to be made between homozygous genotypes as the parents. So, 
all these results are going to be conclusive and with two pairs of genes that we saw in a normal Mendelian dihybrid cross, there were 16 combinations. And if we were to now, without even a checkerboard, uh, try to summarize the whole situation, we would find that there is capital A dash and capital B dash. This in a checkerboard, if you uh, remember from your last uh, lectures, would be 9 out of 16. That means both the dominant uh, genes are present. Whether they are present in a homozygous form or in a heterozygous form can be assumed by making the combinations. The second one would be where only capital A is present. It could be homozygous or heterozygous, does not matter. But then the point which is important is that there is absence of capital B. Likewise, in small a, small a b, there will be three combinations and the small a, small b that means double homozygous recessive would be just 1 of 16. This we had proved on the basis of our calculations also because if you remember the formula was 2 to the power n where n was in the uh, form of the number of heterozygotes. So, naturally, if all these four abbreviated ratios, the genotypic ratios that we are considering are going to interact and one of them adds to the other, then of course, the F2 ratio is going to be modified and the 9331 would not be obtained. It would be a different one. So, this genotypic ratio is very, very useful in predicting the phenotypic ratios and the checkerboards of four line methods is not required at all. If you are in a hurry, you can always reach a conclusion within a minute as to what are the genotypes and what would be the ratio. We will come to a justification of this concept uh, a little later. So, we summarize that 9 a b actually would mean capital A dash capital B small b and uh, the 3 a b would mean capital A, capital A, small b, small b, that means one combination and capital A, small a, small b, small b, two combinations because there is one heterozygote. So, it becomes uh, three. Likewise, we have the other small a and b combination as three and one would be the last because there is no dominant gene involved at all. So, that means uh, this would be the interaction which we would study in terms of epistasis. Stasis means to stand and ep means to, to stand uh, that is upon. So, that means if two of these genes they are controlling a same character, they can interact in several ways. Earlier we used to think that epistasis is one of the interactions. But now, modern thinking makes us to believe that uh, all of these interactions, whether we call them by epistasis or not, have to be included within epistasis because there has to be or there is some sort of a modification, some sort of an alteration, some sort of an inhibition uh, which is involved in one of the genes, be these genes recessive or uh, dominant. So, if we are asked to define epistasis, it is a phenomenon in which the expression of one gene is masked or prevented to function by another non-allelic gene. So, the idea is non-allelic gene. The one that prevents the other gene to act, uh, to act is an epistatic gene and the one which gets suppressed is the hypostatic gene. In uh, Mendelian parlance, we still like to say that A is epistatic to B and likewise B gene is, is hypostatic to A. So, that means these particular genes which are epistatic must definitely be present in terms of their loci at upstream level so that they could they could alter an enzyme or a biochemical pathway to somehow uh, exert epistasis and have some sort of a modification. Now, 
under these circumstances if we have say uh, two or three of these classes joining with each other or intera uh, interacting with each other then definitely the expected ratio of 9331 is bound to change and even uh, it, it is seen that uh, less than four phenotypes are are to be observed so as i said before the epistasis is of two types recessive if there is a recessive gene or an allele uh, which is masking the effect of the other allele does not matter if the other one is dominant in its own right then it will be a case of recessive epistasis. If the gene that is masking the, the function of another gene happens to be a dominant one then it is a case of dominant epistasis. Before embarking upon the examples of recessive or dominant epistasis or any other type of interaction one should always have a firm belief in mind that epistasis should never be confused with dominance it is affecting the the function of another gene fine but then epistasis is an example of an interaction between two different genes that happen to be non allelic Whereas simple dominance would mean that there is a interaction between different alleles of the same gene and we have already talked about whether a single allele is haplosufficient then only a single allele uh, would be would be enough to to show a particular effect or if it is haplo insufficient then definitely it would be required in a homozygous form both recessive as well as dominant one to show that particular effect. So, basically these epistatic interactions are modifications and uh, we would find that the number of phenotypes which would, which would appear in the offspring of a dihybrid parent would be definitely less than 4 this we would see in the examples uh, if you can see on your screens the abbreviated ratio once again uh, that I had shown to you earlier and now you assume that if there is an interaction of a type that the 9 and 3 the first ones they join together then the ratio would become 12 is to 3 is to 1 which is also there and in that case the number of phenotypes classes will now be 3. If uh, we find that 9, 3 and 3 they join together then it becomes 15 is to 1 and therefore we will have only 2 phenotypic classes. There are many more uh, to follow which uh, you, you can make these combinations and we will discuss all of them 9 is to 3 is to 4, 9 is to 7, 12 is to 3 is to 1. 13 is to 3 and likewise. So, that means these are the different types of options where the genes can act. But the underlying point which is important is that the number of phenotypic classes would always be less than 4. There are some cases however, uh, incidentally the first case that the example that we are going to take is the one where there is no change in 9331, but then there are other differences of, of supplementing and collaboration. So, that means uh, I, I would just emphasize that this abbreviated genotypic ratio as I said before is very very important because you can predict these phenotypic ratios immediately and there is no need of a folk line method or a cumbersome checkerboard although we will not totally dispense off with these methods because they are also useful. But then if you have a little more practice and if you have to uh, answer a question uh, say within a minute then of course these abbreviated ratios uh, they, they play wonders in the whole system. Let us then take the first example and where a new or a novel phenotype would come into existence. Actually this is what is called as the collaborator genes and this is what Professor Bateson and Punit uh, worked upon when they were supporting Mendel's ideas and yet they found that there were some exceptions and how could they be fitted into the Mendelian principles. They found out that uh, there are some genes which are at the end of their crosses showing four 
a phenotypic class is all right, but a new phenotype is being uh, generated and therefore, this is what is called as the collaborator genes. The best example that we can take here of uh, Betson and Punit's work is the comb shape in poultry. We find that uh, the, uh, the comb shape in poultry is of different types. For example, I have just given you on the screens even their genetic makeup. So, it will easier for us to, to have the checkerboard or the abbreviated genotypic ratio. Uh, we find that uh, one of the chickens has a comb which is rose shaped. They are the basically the wine dots and uh, their genetic constitution would be that they have to have a capital R gene for rose. Likewise, there is another Brahmas variety which uh, you will find that uh, does not show a rose shaped, but then it is a P shaped uh, comb. When both of them are crossed, so that means this P shaped comb requires a capital P and capital P LLs. And uh, if both of them are crossed, then the hybrid becomes a totally different type of a uh, phenotype whose comb is like a, an open walnut and therefore, it is called as a walnut comb. You can see on the screens that it would now require one at least one capital R and one capital P. So, it is a, a, a it is a double heterozygote. It could be heterozygous for R and, uh, and homozygous for capital P likewise. And if none of the dominant uh, LLs are present uh, and only small r and small p is present, then this becomes a single uh, comb uh, which we are accustomed to see by the uh, by our households. We have the single leg horn chickens. So, a cross between these p and the rose chickens shows a walnut, a walnut uh, type of a morphology and it is a new morphology. And when walnut and walnut are crossed, then you can see on the right hand side of the screens a typical 9 is to 3 is to 4. Now, this 9 3 3 1 has been modified into 9 is to 3 is to 4. So, that means uh, uh, first the number of phenotypic classes has been reduced from 4 to 3. These are some of the other crosses which you can see on your screens which have been made uh, between the, the different types of, uh, of the genotypes just to assume that the ratio in this case uh, would show that the recessive one is the single one or the leg horn and the P as well as the rows, both of them happen to be dominant to this particular uh, type of comb shape. That is why we said that small r, small r and small p, small p uh, denotes the single one. So, in conclusion, we have that the F1 generation consists of uh, four types uh, in the F2 generation uh, that is the 9 walnut, 3 rows, 3 p and one single. That means, here the equation is a little different right and uh, we find that two gene pairs somehow they are influencing the same trait. They are influencing the same trait that means, they are collaborating, they are interacting. If we go back to the ratio, we would find that the ratio still is 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1, right? Because 9 would be walnut, 9 would uh, 3 would be rose, 3 would be uh, the uh, P ones, and only 1 would be the double recessive that is single. Yet the number may be the same yet there is a collaboration or interaction between these different uh, units. So, in conclusion, the abbreviated genotypic ratio is you, you can simply make it out R dash P dash capital R dash small p and small r dash capital P and small r small p. 
so there is no need of of a checkerboard let's take another very important example and that is the duplicate genes with uh, another aspect and uh, that is they are also called as additive genes you must have seen in the market that the summer squashes uh, or cucurbits they have different shapes they could be long they could be spherical or round or they could be disk shaped so in cucurbita pepo uh, the genes they can be described uh, as uh, controlling different uh, shapes of the fruits so capital a capital b uh, capital a capital a that means homozygous double dominant is disk shaped whereas the homozygous double recessive leads to the long fruits so in the market generally we have the long fruits and the and the spherical ones we'll see how the spherical ones they come about now in summer squashes we find that if a disk shaped fruit that is again a homozygous one is crossed with long fruits or uh, all of the progeny are disk fruits so so far so good the law of dominance prevails but then if the f1 is crossed the f2 progeny will show a novel shape now this where did the new shape come from it possesses one dominant allele at least one dominant allele in either of its loci so that means if the dominant allele is absent then the fruit is going to be long if both the dominant alleles are present then it is going to be disk shaped now we are talking about three phenotypes if you look at your screens the genotypes for the disk the spherical and the long has been given so the disk shape shows uh, at least one of the a and one of the b of the capital ones and if it is just a dash and small b b or small a a and capital b that means if there is only one so that means we have uh, a new shape altogether if you look at the checkerboard once again uh, as i said we 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 can dispense with the checkerboard but to for the beginners a checkerboard is a must so we find that the genes a and b somehow are going to collaborate with each other to produce a new phenotype and what this new phenotype is it is a sphere and now the ratio becomes 9 is to 3 plus 3 that is 6 and 1 so that means 9 are the disk shaped 6 out of 16 are spherical or round and just one is going to be long if we were to just at the end try to uh, summarize what really happened was that why different colors were there perhaps both the genes were required to produce the precursors for the pigments and if both the genes were there then both the enzymes were working and uh, therefore the result was disk shaped in the absence of either a or b which you can see on your screens now either a or b you can never have a long shape or a disk shape you would always have a sphere and when none of the uh, dominant alleles is present it has to be a long shape so this is how we justify 9 is to 6 is to 1 in one of our next lectures we would then like to uh, embark upon what is called as recessive epistasis thank you